Silk Road never existed. There, that got your attention. Why then am I going to spend the next 20 or so minutes talking about it? And why is Golden Eagle Luxury Trains launching a Republics of the Silk Road tour? The simple answer is that there was not just one Silk Road, but rather a network of interconnected trading routes along which people, products and ideas travelled across Eurasia. Silk was far from the only, or the most important, good which was transported. And in fact, even the name, the Silk Road, is relatively new. It was coined in the late 19th century by the German geographer Ferdinand von Richthofen, who, coincidentally, was the uncle of the World War I flying ace known as the Red Baron. In my lecture today, I'm going to talk about the history and cultural significance of the Silk Roads. Like Peter Frankopan, the best-selling author on this topic, I will speak about the Silk Roads in the plural. I also want to introduce you to some of the most important sites, places which epitomize the romance of the Silk Roads and hopefully inspire you to visit them on board the Golden Eagle later this year. Where does the Silk Roads start and end? That question sounds simple enough, but if the Silk Road isn't a single road, there isn't just an eastern and western terminus. Instead, it is better to think of a spider's web of roads stretching between Europe and Asia, with hubs at major crossroads. In the West, Venice and Istanbul played a vital role. In the East, there's Xi'an and Dunhuang. To the North, I would certainly include Moscow. And in the South, major cities in the Indian subcontinent. For me though, and I expect for many of you, it is the central part of the Silk Roads which prompts the greatest curiosity, the deepest fascination. Antioch, Baghdad, Damascus, Bukhara, Samarkand. Even the names of these cities spark excitement. Over the centuries, artists, poets, storytellers, and all kinds have created a picture in our collective consciousness about what such places are like. These are the silk roads of our imagination. The history of overland trade is almost as old as humanity and Eurasia's most ancient civilizations played a key role in its development. We know that the lapis lazuli used to make Tutankhamun's funeral mask, for example, was mined in Afghanistan nearly 3,500 years ago, and it was transported more than 2,000 miles from the mines to Egypt. Obsidian, which is naturally occurring volcanic glass found in Ethiopia, went in the opposite direction. The accounts of later travellers such as Marco Polo have given many people the impression that merchants travelled vast distances to sell their precious goods. The reality is that the majority of them shuffled back and forth between relatively local trading centres, selling their products on to other merchants who would complete the next leg of the journey. This is why at every significant crossroads there was a large bazaar, and the wealth and the jobs created by that commercial activity stimulated the growth of cities, drawing people in from the surrounding countryside. The location of these crossroads, and therefore the bazaars and cities, was dictated largely by physical geography. If you look at the Silk Roads marked on a map, you will notice they very rarely follow the shortest route between points A and B. The reason for this is that there are barriers in the way, lakes and mountains, rivers and deserts. Travelling on foot, perhaps accompanying a caravan of camels or horses, you have to plan your route based on where there are supplies of drinking water and places where the water level is low enough to ford a river or there happens to be a bridge. You cannot plot a high altitude route through the Pamir or Hindu Kush mountain ranges in winter. And there is a reason that the Taklamkan Desert and Basa Kelmis a salt flat in Karakal, Pakistan, both translate loosely as the place of no return. Even today, the least hospitable environments are sparsely populated and lacking in transport infrastructure, 
and that is in spite of the possibilities afforded to us by modern technology. When you travel on board the Golden Eagle, more often than not, you'll be following these same ancient trading routes across the landscape. The train is, I assure you, considerably faster than a Bactrian camel, and sleeping in your cabin is immeasurably more comfortable than kipping amongst the animals, bags of trade goods, and snoring fellow merchants on the floor of a caravanserai. But many of the views have changed little, if at all, and the anticipation of arriving somewhere you have long longed to see is no less exciting. We know that Genghis Khan kept his eyes fixed on the Kalon Minaret as he rode through the deserts to attack Bukhara, and that its image on the horizon became so fixed in his mind that he forbade his marauding horde from touching it, even as they destroyed everything around it. More than 800 years after the Mongols sacked Bukhara, the Kalon Minaret is still intact, standing ready to welcome new arrivals. In many of the cities, including in Golden Eagle's Republics of the Silk Road itinerary, you can still visit the historic bazaars. My particular favourites are the domed trading halls of Bukhara, which look magnificent in the early evening light. Lively Soyob Bazaar, which is next to the Bibi Kanu Mosque in Samarkand, and Chorsu Bazaar in Tashkent, which has been in this location for hundreds of years and is now crowned with a blue tiled Soviet era dome. In these markets, you can buy almost anything. There are spices and vegetables, nuts, fresh and dried fruits, and the mouth-watering, mouth delicious bread I've ever tasted. The butchers have their stalls, no part of the animal goes to waste, and tables groan under the weight of pyramids of sugar, chocolates, and other tempting snacks. Beyond the food halls, you'll find textiles and homeware, car parts, bric-a-brac, school supplies, pretty much anything you can think of. Some of the goods on sale are from China or Turkey, but demand for goods which could not be grown or made locally is what created the Silk Road in the first place. I see it as evidence of continuity. There are plenty of local products too, and when I'm shopping, these are the things I want to buy. When you take the train through the Fagana Valley to Osh, Margalan and Kokand, you are in what is probably the most fertile area of Central Asia. The fruits grown here, including strawberries and cherries, peaches, melons and watermelons, are the sweetest and often fattest I've tasted anywhere in the world, thanks to the sun-drenched days. In spite of their quality, these fruits are rarely exported to Europe, so you will need to buy them here if you're to taste the difference for yourself. I warn you, however, once you've eaten a kilo of Uzbek strawberries, a punnet from Tesco or even from Marks and Spencers is never quite going to hit the spot again. I love to see exactly where my food has come from and meet the people who have produced it. It is possible to visit the vineyards and orchards and even see the experimental glass houses growing papayas, bananas and other tropical fruits in Kokand. Sad as it is, you may not have space in your suitcase to take a watermelon home. You should, however, make room for locally made handicrafts, both gifts and souvenirs, even if that means buying an extra bag. In the bazaars, you can browse silks and embroideries, hand-painted ceramics, clay figurines, musical instruments and fetching hats, items you will learn more about during a visit to the Museum of Applied Arts in Tashkent. The best way to discover how such items are made, however, and to appreciate the skill which goes into them, is to watch a master craftsman at work. At the Odgolic Silk Factory in Margalan, they still use traditional techniques to produce their exquisite silks, and there are plenty of workshops producing ceramics, puppets, embroidery, carpets and more in Kiva and in Bukhara. Your local guides and the staff on the train will be there to help you with recommendations of what to buy, where, and what is a fire price to pay. One of my favourite spots, and I'll tell you about it now, is the Kiva Silk Carpet Workshop inside the Itchen Kala, which is Kiva's ward city. <coughs> this carpet workshop was founded 20 years ago as a joint project between UNESCO and Operation Mercy to revive traditional dyeing and weaving skills, and to create jobs for local women. 
The workshop is the subject of A Carpet Ride to Kiva by Chris Azan Alexander. And it's one of the best contemporary pieces of travel writing about Central Asia. A wonderful book to read before your trip. In cities such as Kiva, handicrafts workshops and shops have spread beyond the original bazaars into the surrounding monuments. This might sound a little odd, but there's something cyclical about it. Merchants made money from trade. With their profits, they paid artisans to build mosques and madrasas, minarets and mausolea, bathhouses, caravanserais and more. They wanted to show off their wealth, their power, and their taste. And in some cases, to try and gain absolution for their sins. The Mir-e-Arab Madrasa in Bukhara, for example, was paid for by the 16th century Sheikh Abdullah Yamani of Yemen, who had made the money from the sale of 3,000 Persian slaves. The artisans and traders, albeit smaller ones with less controversial businesses, are reclaiming the magnificent monuments that they built. For this talk, I have picked five very different monuments which you will visit on the Republics of the Silk Road tour, and which I feel collectively sum up the majesty and variety of the Silk Roads. Firstly, there is the mausoleum of the Seljuk Sultan, Ahmed Sanjar, in Merv, Turkmenistan. In the early 17th century, Merv might well have been the largest city in the world, with a population of half a million people up to 20 times the size of London in the same period. The Seljuks ruled an empire stretching from Anatolia in Turkey all of the way to the Hindu Kush, and Merv was their imperial capital. Sultan Ahmed Sanjar ruled for almost 40 years. His domed tomb, which has some architectural similarities with the earlier Samanid mausoleum in Bukhara, has foundations 4.2 meters deep, and it was so strongly built that even though the Mongols set it ablaze, they were unable to destroy the building. Originally, the dome would have been decorated with glazed blue tiles, but those sadly have not survived. The mausoleum is built of baked mud bricks, which are by far the most common construction material in Central Asia, where building stone and wood are both in short supply. There are some spectacular examples of wooden architecture, however, including the Friday Mosque in Kiva, Uzbekistan which is part of the city's UNESCO World Heritage Site. The mosque looks unremarkable from the street, but when you step through the heavy wooden doors, you are met with what looks like a forest. This is because the roof is supported on a grid of 213 wooden columns carved from black elm. The oldest of these pillars was carved in the 10th century, though most are of a later date, and every one of them has a unique design. There is very little light inside this mosque, so the atmosphere is quiet and contemplative, just as if you were in the cool shade of trees. These first two buildings are historically and architecturally significant, but they don't dazzle visually as much as some. My third monument, therefore, is all about the wow factor, and remarkably, it is a modern creation, less than a decade old. It is the Koki Nauru's palace in Dushanbe, Tajikistan. The name is a bit of a misnomer, as it isn't, and was never intended to be, a palace. The original plan was it would be the world's largest tea house, but that morphed over time, and it is now the venue for high profile conferences and other events, and also a showcase for the applied arts. Around 4,000 artisans from across Tajikistan have worked on the project which includes glittering chandeliers, wood carving, surfaces inlaid with semi-precious stones, marble latticework, painted panels, and rather a lot of gold gilt. When I first heard about Kohina Rus, I was concerned that it would be so over the top that it was tacky, but somehow they've managed to pull it off. And all I have is admiration for the architects and craftsmen responsible. You will have a guided tour of the most impressive rooms, followed by tea and snacks to give you time to soak up the ambience and take a closer look at some of the details. I think that the Kujia Khan Palace in Kokand, Uzbekistan, is one of Central Asia's masterpieces, but too often it is left off tourist itineraries. That's why I'm so glad that Golden Eagle agrees with me that it's worth including in your trip and why I'm featuring it here. Known as the Pearl of Kokand, 
It is the last in a sequence of seven palaces built by the rulers of the Khanate of Kokand on this site. It is said that it took 80 master builders and 16,000 conscripted laborers to build it, and that once finished, it had more than 100 rooms. Most of the palace was destroyed by the Bolsheviks in 1918, but just enough of it survives to give you an idea of the opulent lifestyle of the Khans. The entire facade of the palace is tiled in an unusual blue, yellow and green colour scheme, which makes it look quite different from the tiled monuments elsewhere on the Silk Roads. I have saved the most famous of the monuments till last. For many of you, the opportunity to see the Registan in Samarkand will be the reason you chose to travel along the Silk Roads. It is the centrepiece of the city's UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it is to Uzbekistan as the Taj Mahal is to India, or the Eiffel Tower is to Paris, an architectural icon which has come to represent the destination. Registan means sandy place, and it was the open square in the center of the Timurid city, the imperial capital of Amir Timur. This is where people would have gathered to hear official proclamations, to trade, and to watch public executions. Today, the square is flanked by three madrasas, Islamic schools akin to university colleges, which date from the 15th to the 17th centuries. I have stood in this square dozens of times over the past 13 years and will never, ever get tired of the view. Just thinking about it gets me excited. Yes, the scale is impressive, but it's not just that. It is the ornateness of the geometric tile work, the beauty of the color palette the strange animal motifs on the facade of the shared or madrasa, and the glittering gold interior of the Kittilakori Mosque, which shine bright from every angle. I feel very privileged to be here, to admire the monuments, but also have the time to watch local families, some of whom are coming here for the first time, who are standing in awe and learning about their own cultural heritage, something many citizens were cut off from during the Soviet period. For them, coming to the Registan is like a pilgrimage. It is an experience to be treasured. I am approaching the end of my talk now, but before I finish, I want to say a bit more about the people you will meet on your journey. Every time you disembark from the train, you will meet students, couples, families with young children, and increasingly, groups of pensioners who are traveling around their own countries, seeing the same sights as you. They will be speaking Kazakh, Kyrgyz, Tajik, Uzbek and Russian, and plenty of other languages besides. As the Silk Roads have always been, by their nature, a melting pot of different peoples and cultures. Many of the younger generation and those working in the tourism and hospitality sector will chat to you in English. Seize the opportunity to talk to them, because through these conversations, you will learn so much about Central Asia today, and it will enrich your travel experience. Along the Silk Roads and on board the Golden Eagle, guests are treated like gods, so enjoy every minute of your trip.